Hello, folks. Jack Spierko here with episode five. Is it five? Is it right? We just said five, five of UnloosetheGoose.com. Uh, tonight, we have a quorum. We have Sal Mayweather, Xavier Hawk, Nicole Sauce, and myself uh, on the show tonight. We are streaming on live on YouTube, and you can catch us there or on any of the podcast streaming services uh, if you don't want to watch us live. Anyway, tonight we are going to take on the food system. And Unloose the Goose was put together as a concept from the beginning of having great minds come together and discuss basically systems that are screwed up and how we can fix them. And so what we want to start out tonight with, and we want to do a little bit of it, we want to talk about the existing food system that, I mean, we can say what it actually does well and it keeps people from starving to death at least so far um but on the other side it, it has a lot of problems and i, I kind of want to just start off with throwing it out to the group and y'all decide where you want to go with this but one at a time what do you see as the biggest failure of the existing food system i see the biggest failure as a desire for top-down control of regulation. So there's been a real push to oversee it from the federal level and to make all of the rules uniform as we spread our food around, which has resulted in the monopolization of whole swaths of food. And you see this when things happen like meat packing plants go down and that's actually a big deal. That shouldn't be a big deal. The, no. the butcher I was at today if he was shut down because of COVID, it would have impacted like 10 families. But because of how hard it is to adhere to the federal oversight, we have giant swaths of the food industry all in one corporation. And then you have huge outbreaks when you have something like E. coli and the lettuce or whatever happens there, rather than little decentralized pods where the damage is much less. Yeah, I think that probably the biggest problem with the food system is that we have the state involved in it. It's way too <laughs> important of a thing to leave into the hands of politicians. Uh, their mismanagement is just going to drive up costs and drive down quality. And it's frankly going to probably uh, taint the food supply at times. So uh, the more we can get people to be independent and uh, not rely on the state, I think the better off we're all going to be. Yeah, I would agree with both of those and add... Uh, you know, a, a heap of Monsanto and, and messing with the genetics of these plants, um, messing with their biospheres, not planting heirloom and not having a decentralized gardening system. I think like um, there was some study that was done in Russia where they found that they produced more vegetables and more crops if everybody produced a little bit on their own rather than having one monoculture or monolithic uh, centralized food system. Oh, and the little bit where they you know, they grow the vegetable in California, they send it to Taiwan to get packaged and then send it back to, to fucking Florida or wherever. Like, <laughs> that's, that's just stupid. There was, uh, there was a thing Phil Mollison said one time about how it was probably the case that even within a country that there was an item in New York that was being sold to California and the exact same item was being sold from California to New York. And there were probably two semi trucks on our highway system passing each other with identical product going to the opposite markets. And, and that is insanity. And I, I think yeah. like everything that everybody said really goes back to what Sal said. Of uh, The problem is that the state's involved in the first place. Because my biggest issue, honestly, isn't even just production or the regulations. It's what people are told to eat. It's the instruction that we, and, and I, I occasionally I have to remember how strong this is because since I don't give a fuck what they tell me to eat and I eat what I want and by eating what I want, which is exactly what they said not to eat over the last year, I lost 65 pounds. Right. And I'm in like the best shape I've been in since I was 28 years old and I'm almost 50. I, I forget that sometimes. And I forget how I went to school in the 1980s and I was taught that I needed to eat bread that I needed to eat bread, I needed to eat grains, I needed to eat starches, that my entire dietary pyramid, which is what it used to be, was based on the fact that I needed to eat lots of grain, I needed to eat lots of starch. And what that eventually did was turn me into a fat ass and push me toward the brink of oblivion nutritionally. Because everything in our system, as bad as it is, Stiles dead on when he says, you know, the state's involved at all. Well, why, why do we 
subsidize the things we subsidize in agriculture? Why do all of our subsidies go to corn and wheat and barley and rye? And that's because that's what they built the pyramid on. So yes, it's because they're involved at all that that's the case, but that's the thing that they're doing that I think is harming the most people. We've had all this craziness about COVID. And if you actually believe the numbers, which I don't, then you could say that about 150,000 people in America died this year because of COVID. If we look at it with any level of intellectual honesty, at least 75,000 of those people would have died this year anyway, at least, at least, period. Like there's no debating that. 300,000 people this year will die of direct complications due to obesity. That's not cardiovascular disease exasperated by. That is, this guy died because he was fat, 300,000. And 300,000 died last year. And 300,000 will dry next year. And in one presidential term, that means 1.2 million Americans that did not have to die will die. And it goes back to little Johnny and little Susie sitting in a classroom and being told when they're three or four or five years old, go home and eat your bread. And if we forget how powerful that programming is just because we broke it, then we don't understand like all the people left in a matrix, if that makes sense. I think it's important though to understand why the pyramid is the way it is, why it's so screwed up. And a lot of it has to do with political parasitism. It's because a lot of these political parasites are taking money from lobbyists to construct the food pyramid and these guidelines and these regulations in a certain way that's beneficial towards them, but at no regard to our health whatsoever. It's all about what keeps the politicians in power, what maintains the status quo. That's what makes it so dangerous, you know? Sal, with your background and the way you come at the whole thing of with anarchism and agorism, have you ever really like done a deep dive or thought about how the reason that government embraced grain is because it's the easiest thing to commoditize to the point where it can be taxed. Like, because you can take grain and you can put it in a silo and it can sit there and you can cut a bill against it. Some of the first money was actually bills against grain, right? right. And where if even, even like some of the big commodity crops today of like beef and pork and chicken, they've gotten better today with that. But if you go back to the genesis of all this, you know, a cow is a cow. It moves around. It takes a dump. If you, if you kill it before you're ready, it rots and dies before there was refrigeration. But I can harvest rye or wheat or barley, and I can keep it for seven or eight years, and it's still useful. So the fact that I could say there's a bushel, there's a quantity that I can quantify in tax, I think that's a big part of why we still have this vestige of this today. You're exactly right. Have you read the book um, by James C. Scott? Uh, I think he's a professor from Yale called Against the Grain. But uh, he's basically saying the exact same thing, just in a much more scientific way. A lot of the earliest states that we have on record started around grain societies because it was easier for taxes to be apportioned. They could say, oh, okay, Jack Spierko, you grew this amount of uh, wheat this year. This is how much you owe. So it became very easy for them. That's why uh, if you look at like the areas around like coastal estuaries, states didn't form around these areas until much later. So definitely, if anybody out there is interested in reading about this, check out that book by Against the Grain. He was also in Pete's documentary, Monopoly on Violence. You can hear more about it there, too. But that sounds like exactly what you're saying. I haven't read that book, but I think he's the guy that wrote Seeing Like a State as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to put that on my list. Brilliant. Brilliant. I Great mean, book, too. This is like the origin of all society, right? Food and taxation, serfs, monarchs. You grew this much, you owe me this much. I mean, that's, that's, that is how humanity has been controlled since the jump. Yeah, that's why, go ahead. I was gonna say, that's why it's so important for people to uh, become, like I said, become uh, independent and not reliant on the state and grow their own food and do things like Nicole's doing and go homesteading and things like that. It's, it's absolutely crucial. It's one of the most important things people can do uh, to bring about the Agora is to become less reliant on the state's food systems. The guy that turned me on to Scott was uh, Toby Hemingway. And what he talked about was how there's this divide that's traditionally existed between societies of almost like the flatland people and the hill people. And that the hill people were the people that were hunter gatherers. They might've grown food, they were horticulturists, but they weren't agriculture. So agriculture does not mean the culture of plants. Agriculture means the culture of fields. Horticulture is the culture of plants. And that's where I want us to get to tonight is talking about culturing plants and culturing livestock and hunter-gatherer lifestyle in a modern age. But 
the person in the hills did not see the deer as the enemy that came and ate their corn that they owed a share of to the king. The person in the hills said, oh, so the deer wants to eat some of my garden, so I'll, I'll plant a little more garden, and now I have a deer garden. Because when the deer comes, I'll stab the deer with a spear or an arrow, and now I have meat and vegetables to cook together. And so the entire mindset was different. And then what created even of a greater divide, and it wasn't always the hill and the flat, but that's just a very common divider, is that the person in the agricultural area saw all the things, including the people that came from the hills as the enemy, that came to take what they had, to, to be an, an invader. And then the people in the hills always saw the people in the flatlands as being the ones that want to parasite me. They want to take my stuff. They want me to contribute to their thing that I don't want to be a part of. And I guess those were the original geese. Yeah, and I don't know that that's changed. The people in the hills still kind of see the people in the flatlands as the parasites. And some of those parasites are reg trying to regulate how one lives on their own land. It's, it's kind of absurd that I can't that they shoot. can't even see right it's one thing i can't, where it's like I can't shoot a deer a on my land if it's yeah. if it's not deer season right yeah and and i understand why they they don't want all of the deer wiped out or whatever but still like i'm not stupid i'm not gonna just go out there and kill every nourishing animal that exists in nature so that next year i'm screwed no and, and You're I like think, me, right? You have three acres. So even if you killed every deer you ever saw in your land, <laughs> you know what happened? Deer would be like, screw that shit. I'm not going to I'm the going calls. over here. Yeah, yeah. Which would keep them from eating your garden. Right. Which would solve the problem. Like, you know, as a, a, small, a small farmer, I, I, I ran ducks and, and chickens for years. For, I don't know commercially anymore. I used to do commercially. And people would be like, well, you would kill a hawk that was killing your, your animals? Well, yeah, because once it figures out what it can do, yeah, it will literally come take one a day until I have nothing left. So I don't want to kill a hawk, Xavier or otherwise, but if I have a problem animal who has now become attached to what I'm doing, sure, I would do that. Oh, it's federally protected. Everything's federally protected. And that's the problem, right? I mean, like that's, and we have a situation now where like Jill Salatin was talking one time about how it is illegal technically for him to write books on his farm because it's a non-agricultural commercial enterprise. And his land say, is so, that just, it, it's like mind boggling. The look on Xavier's face just now was really good. <laughs> he like, he contorted in three directions about that one. I just can't believe the- That was amazing. The amount of invasiveness that people yeah. think that they can get away with. And again, it goes back to some of our first episodes, like the bully will keep bullying until you say no and stop and have the force with all, the wherewithal and the force to be able to make them to stop. And the tool they use against us, uh, one of the ones that just sticks in my craw is zoning. It's, mm. you know, like land use planning and zoning is killing the farmer under the guise of protecting the farmer. Yeah. So land use planning and zoning, if it were to really happen in my county, the way they'd probably do it, ultimately, I wouldn't be allowed to have what I have here. I mean, luckily, we don't have that at this time. But I would end up being drawn into the little map with a beautiful little magic marker as a place that's close enough to the lake where people who want to be at the lake don't want to have livestock around. Which the interesting thing about what you have is you, you're a classic example of what Toby Hemingway used to call liberation permaculture where unless they happen to see your animals because that would be your one weakness if yeah. somebody a tax assessor drives by your property they're like well, there's a bunch of weeds in some old ass house up there <laughs> right? and they don't have any idea what they're looking at and that's kind of as we steer toward solutions now like that's the like i think a lot of people when they go into food production they want to look like a small farm and in my opinion you don't want to look anything like a farm you want somebody looking at you to go, look at all that overgrown shit, unless you're an HOA. And then you want to be like, oh, look at all those pretty plants. And they don't need to know those pretty beautiful colors are edible shard or something like that, right? Or, you know, there's some herb that has a flower or something like that. Like, we need to adapt almost more chameleon-like to what we're going on. But as we, as we make this shift, we didn't answer the most important question of the night, what everybody's drinking. So let's take a pause here. Wait. And everybody, what are you drinking? Because I know everybody's drinking something. Sal, you drinking? You're going to be disappointed. I got San Pellegrino. I sound a little <laughs> disappointed. All right. 
This is a very special bottle of Booker's that was given to me by the gaggle. So the Goose Group pooled their money and bought me this bourbon as a thank you for doing some website work last week. And I appreciate it. So I thought I'd have that tonight. Thanks, guys. Well, y'all crashed the fucking site. So Nicole had to fix it all by herself. So we had to do all something All by myself. Her. Absolutely. 100%. Hawk, what are you, what are you, what are you uh, sucking down there? Dosa Keys. He, he's muted again. He doesn't know it. It's, he... <laughs> it was, Dosa Keys, yes. Uh, I, I was trying to dig out some mead, but I didn't have enough time to do it before the show started. I have it packed away in the back. And I'm drinking a, a, a good old, old fashioned. And uh, I'll, these people need to sponsor us for this shit. Uh, Knob Creek is, is the bourbon in this, but it's actually uh, made by a company called On the Rocks premium cocktails and cool. i'm not usually a pre-mixed guy but i'll tell you for something that's in the refrigerator that you can just have pretty good so let's let's move this toward go ahead Hop yeah up. yeah i've got our first question from our live audience and it is relating to um tower gardens type solutions something simple for a city environment thoughts on vertical farming indoor farming hydroponics jack i know you've got a whole hydroponics system that you've designed yeah, we'll we'll get there. Let's okay. let's hold hold fire on that right now, and I think we're actually going to actually go right into that, but more from everybody's perspective. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with Sal, newest member of the gaggle. I was listening to some of your podcasts, uh, the Agora, and I heard you say there were four things people should do. One was a three D printer, and it was two other ones, and I don't. I think cryptocurrency. There's one other one I can't remember, which is rare for me to not remember shit. But one was plant a guard. And so I kind of want to start with you there because I know the least about kind of your agro horticulture thing. What are your thoughts on that? So there's, <clears throat> there's three things that I tell people to, uh, that they can do to get started. Because I always get the question, how do I get started in counter economics? What can I do? I don't want to go to jail, right? I want to do something stupid and get myself in trouble. And I always tell them <laughs> the best way to get involved in counter economics that's going to not get you in that much trouble at least is to grow your own food, start a garden, become, like I said, become less reliant on the state. And the, you know, it's, it's funny because the thing that everyone always says to me is that, oh, you silly agorist, do you think that growing potatoes is gonna stop the government? What's wrong with you? And I, I always think that the, it's always potatoes for some reason, which is weird, but it's, <laughs> it's, also, it's also ironic. Potatoes and you know, Somalia. Sweet potatoes are so much easier. But it, it really is an ironic example if you considered like the cascading effect that the potato subsidy has on the political economy, right? I mean, if you don't believe me, look at all of the pandering that goes on in Iowa every four years. But uh, so yeah, I, they always say, oh, what's wrong with you, Agoras? Growing your own food isn't going to make you more free. And I always respond with, look, it does three things. Number one, it denies the state tax revenue. All of us eat food. So that's a hell of a lot of revenue that we could and should be denying them. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that it disintermediates agricultural regulations, right? In this country, uh, they make you, I don't know if it's the FDA or what agency or what alphabet soup, they make you wash your eggs in this country. And that screws up the whole, uh, mm. you have to refrigerate eggs over here and that adds to the cost and other countries don't have to do that. That drives up costs that get passed down to the consumer. It denies poor families access to food. It goes on and on and on. That's the second reason. And the third and final reason people should grow their own food is because it's a hedge against the government mismanagement of supply chains, right? Just a few months ago with coronavirus, we didn't have, uh, there was like a week or two, we couldn't have, we couldn't find any milk. There was no milk on the shelves. I mean, cow's milk, goat's milk, whole milk, skim milk, almond milk, coconut milk, there was nothing. But I would bet that um, Nicole and other homesteaders didn't have any problem like that because they're not as reliant on these supply chains. So I really think it's, the, it's probably the easiest thing that people could do to get, to get started in, in agorism. So as we started- and I have learned how to milk an almond, by the way. <laughs> milk an almond. No, I know how to make almond milk. <laughs> so before, before I go to the next of y'all on this, I, I just wanna, on something Sal said, for those that are maybe like, well, sure you have to refrigerate an egg. I just want you to think about this. People like me that, that raise poultry, if we're going to put eggs in an incubator or under a broody bird, a bird that will take them and raise them, we don't want to have a dozen eggs and two hatch today and two hatch tomorrow and two hatch Thursday, right? We want them to all hatch around the same time. So if I only have like four birds and I need to save a dozen eggs to hatch and 
I want them all to go to incubation on the same day and I'm getting about three eggs a day. I'll just save those eggs for four days and I'll put them all in incubation on the same day and they'll hatch within hours of each other. And all I have to do that to do that is not let them get too cold and not let them get too warm, which room temperature will do that. So I can sit eggs on my counter for eight, 10 days and then put them in an incubator and they'll start incubating almost as like that's zero hour. It's a little bit advanced, but it's not much. Like if I take eggs and I save them day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and I put them all in the incubator together, the ones I saved, saved on day one will hatch an hour or two ahead. If that egg can go in an incubator and hatch, there is no way infinity that it poses a health risk to you to eat it. That's insane. And if anybody here ever open a bad egg, you don't have to go like, go check the date. You crack a bad egg. It's a bad egg. You're not going to eat it. So the thing with refrigeration, that's, that's one of the worst things. My grandparents, they had a bowl that sat on the kitchen table and all the eggs, you put them in the bowl and my grandma used them. And by the end of the week, you know, you started a new bowl so that at least you use the newest eggs first. And we never refrigerated an egg. Hawk, what do you got on this? And you're muted. There you go. Yeah. So there's there's a couple things i agree with everything that sal said and and it goes back to some of your earliest uh shows on survival podcasts it's like the number one way you can start uh saving money and being prepared for when times get tough is be producing a percentage of your own food um you start out at 20 percent. start out you know build from there and once you can get fully independent boy are you more healthy because you're not eating processed foods you're getting food directly full of nutrition, more than likely full of nutrition that's required for you specifically. And, you know, it's not super hard. They're, the the main products on our farm are nettles, stinging nettles, right? Which is like way more nutritious than spinach that you can buy in a store and chicken eggs and duck eggs, right? So we would have all of those. And on that, that the, the, the nettles just grow on their own. You don't have to do anything, right? They just replicate and grow and like they end up taking over areas. And um, you don't want to step through them. You put on gloves, you harvest them. It's, it's, look it up. It's really easy to do and really easy to cook and super nutritious. So we'd have lots of, um, uh, you know, egg, egg uh, pie. I forget what it's called. Uh, for, quiche? Frittata. quiche? Yeah, quiche. Frittata? Frittata. 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 Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, we'd have that a lot. And we'd end up having, like, you know, eggs for, for lunch and, and things like that. And whenever a chicken got old, we'd have chicken for dinner with, you know, nettles. And then, obviously, we grew more food. So it was, a, it was a process, right? You get to a point where all you're doing at the store is, you know, butter and sometimes milk, depending if you have goats or not. Yeah, I just did an episode called Eggs, the Protein that Fed America for Centuries. And, and it really was like people have, I think we're going back to that world of eggs. And like, if you think about it, the person with a backyard flock three, four months ago when there were shortages, at least you had protein and fat for your family. And trading goods. And trading goods. And, uh, yeah, all of a sudden, my neighbors were like, I don't know, $8 for duck eggs, you know, because we do $8 <laughs> a dozen. They're like, well, they're actually 12 now. Well, I'll take two. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. there's a waiting list. <laughs> what? Yeah. That, hey, you didn't want them. And now, you know, because we have people that, like, have cancer and stuff that are going through chemo, and they use duck eggs as part of their nutrition. And it's like, I'm sorry, you didn't want to buy my duck eggs from me across the street a year ago now you need and that's like a lesson right there like man you need to form relationships with your local producers now nicole what are, what are your thoughts on this kind of just that initial like the things people can do and why they should be doing it well growing food is so easy anywhere at a minimum you can grow your herbs on a windowsill or if you don't have a window you need to move but if you don't have a window you can get a grow light and i i like to call it money i never earned or mine Money I didn't have to earn. I didn't have to pay taxes on. I need food. In Tennessee, we pay a grocery tax. So I like literally if I buy food here, I pay tax on it, which is retarded. And then um, if you grow it, they don't know. And so I think as an initial step towards independence, that adds to your stability. That was a huge boon when we had all of the shutdowns. I was playing around with growing indoor lettuce by happenstance at that point. And we had fresh lettuce the whole time without going to the store. So it's, it's also, I think the confidence. Wasn't it funny that that's what disappeared? Yeah. Fresh greens was one of the first Gone. things. Gone. Easiest yeah. thing to make in the whole Nobody world. Nobody right? wants their greens and all of a sudden there are none. Yeah. 
So, so I think it's a great first step. I, you know, back to Sal's things on, on cryptocurrency, I've been kind of floating along the cryptocurrency world, but after our last episode, I'm like everything I can do with cryptocurrency, including food transactions, we're going to do it because those two things support each other. And that supports a network of people mm -hmm. who are also freedom minded, who will work with you to keep it local, keep it more stable. And then that's the other keep, aspect keep of our this. freedom peeps, right? That's the other part of this that I think is so important is not only is it important to grow your own food or, or you know, to have this garden or agricultural production, but then go out and trade it, right? If you, yeah. if you can trade it with your neighbors or barter, if you could do it for silver coins or cryptocurrency, that's even more disinterested. Or a haircut. Right, exactly. You know? It's even more disruptive. Yeah, well, I and think I, I saw a question on YouTube about how do I tap into an Agoras network? How do we build one? We already have yeah. it. Once yes. you start doing this and trading, you'll find out. I got 10 free chickens or eight free chickens today from somebody who I know who's also freedom-minded, who was taking all of his chickens to slaughter. Eight of them are too small. So I'm going to feed them for two weeks and then I'm going to process them, right? So he basically said it's, it's better to give them to you yeah. than transport and pay for processing. Right. Because they're underweight and my sale volume so uh, think about this though so you got a, a decentralized system here this is really powerful so while this covid crap was going on we had people killing their pigs and burying them on their own farms rather than process them because the volume they had was disproportionate to what they could give away where a small producer just went oh you'll take eight chickens you know what screw i don't want to pay four dollars to process a chicken that i can sell for twelve dollars that I have $13 into. I, I, I don't, that math doesn't work. I'm not going to kill it. And I don't want to, and if, people are like, well, why didn't a farmer, you know, process it and keep it himself? Because a farmer has to grow food to make money. It's like the mechanic doesn't want to work on their own car, right? Like, they, like, I would rather just get rid of, I would offload this. Why don't they keep it for eight, you know, two more weeks? And because it's only eight, it doesn't make any yeah. sense, right? But here, Nicole, you can have them. And what does Nicole yeah. say? Thank you. Thank you. Come to my uh, Christmas party and we'll probably be serving chicken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you, <laughs> you know? see, you can keep them more than two weeks. You can keep three or four, feed them a bunch of like windfall apples or something, fatten them up, and you can process them at 10 pounds. Yeah. And you're not worried if one of the seven dies, you're going to lose money. You don't care. You're in a different sphere than that producer. So you can take out of his load something that's not good for him. And that's that's actually really powerful. And that's 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 awesome. I mean, it really is. Sal, were you going to say something? Yeah, we know that the state is that's one of the Sal. biggest. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh I, I, I was good. I had nothing. I had nothing on that one. All right, but, go ahead. Go ahead, Hawk. Yeah, the the question that came in from Martin Snow is, what are the fundamental challenges to creating an agorist wide scale food system? The things that you're talking about are decentralized solutions, and usually happen in you know little little pockets. Somebody's got a relationship. But when we know the state is a, a challenge in being able to do this on a large scale or organize it on a large scale, um, what are some other challenges besides that and or how do we get around that? We talked about that in one of the other episodes where you talked about um, how you had milk and you sold it as pet food, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of this is let's stop trying to create a community so we can do things and let's do things so we get a community. Let's flip that. Yeah. So, when I was a young aggressive salesperson, I, and I worked in uh, the, I worked, I worked in structured cabling. That was my first sales job. My manager took me to the front of this beautiful office that they'd given me with this great big window that looked out over Dallas, and you could see because Dallas is flat, you could see like 15 miles and 180 degrees, and there were buildings everywhere. And he said, "That's your office. If you're in here, you're not going to make any money." He's like, "There's not a single business out there." that doesn't have more than two cables in their network, every one of those is a potential customer, go get them, right? And I wrote like two, two and a half million dollars of business in my first six months because I actually listened to that and did it. I see so many people say they want to be Agoras. So how many buildings that you see have people inside them that eat food? All of them. So instead of worrying about the community, why don't you figure out what you can produce and, and start asking 
the caring Karens of the world that want to be seen as special and supporting local food and you know, organic and what hygienic and whatever. And why don't you just start saying, Hey, um, will you buy a little tub of salad greens every week for 20 bucks or 15 bucks or say $10 that you make say $10 profit. So it's 12 50. If you have $2 and 50 cents into it. Um, how many of those do you need to change your life? Well, somebody might stop me. How about you try before you bitch about something? Like I had a guy emailing me back, like asking me for advice this week. And like after three times of me answering him and that like, you're lucky if you get three answers from me, he said, but if, and I said, as soon as somebody starts making an excuse about what might happen if they do something they haven't tried yet, I get bored. I get pissed. Right? Like, I like why, like I guarantee you the average person, no matter how many laws say it's illegal, from their backyard could produce two to three hundred dollars worth of food a week that they could sell to their neighbors and they will never hear a word from anybody and one in a hundred will and you fight that battle when you get there and the worst thing they're going to do is say you must stop okay i'll stop and two weeks later you start again and you figure out who the bitch that reported you is and don't tell her you're selling again i mean that's that's the easy and, and uh, Curtis brought it up last time. The reason I can do what I do without being messed with, even though I'm public, I'm on YouTube. I got videos of me doing illegal shit right on YouTube. There's me doing illegal shit and nobody bothers me too small to really get anybody's attention. Right. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be big. I'm not trying to have 27 offices across the country. I don't want to do that. Right. I'm sure I actually think I do follow most of the regulations for the duck eggs we sell, but I'm sure if some ass clown came in here and tried to find something they could, he's got other things to do. He's got other things to do. I mean, it, we were running at one time, 150 birds. We were selling to five restaurants, big, like you know, uh, uh, James Beard award-winning restaurants and nobody ever bothered us because we just did it. And we just didn't worry about what would happen. We figured if something happens, I'll deal with it. So if anybody out there is into agriculture and likes to farm, I, in, in 2004, I started a food, not lawns, right? It was a novel idea. It was uh, growing people, growing food in people's lawns, people who didn't want to, didn't use their lawns or whatever. And then Curtis came around and fucking took off and did that. And he did it phenomenally well. If he were here, he'd be able to speak to that. I wish he were. But that's something that you could do in your local town. I mean, you could just spin farming is I guess what it's called. That's yeah. what he calls it, right? Spin farming. And it's basically you go around to all of your neighbors in your neighborhood who don't use their lawn for jack shit and ask them, hey, we'll make it more beautiful by growing food and we'll give you a portion of that food. And then you have product to take to market, you know? CSA. You know, he went from like three acres and he pared it down to like three quarters of an acre of actual production because he's like, I'm working too hard. I'm having to hire too many people and three quarters of an acre. He was knocking down a six figure income from three quarters of an acre. And he owned like, I think he owned like a fifth of that. He eventually bought a house and he had his backyard he was using, but like four fifths of that three quarter acre that he was making a hundred grand a year on Canadian dollars. That's fake money. Um, <laughs> right. It's faker money. Right. Like he didn't even own it. Right. And he paid nothing for, he didn't rent it from them. He would like, oh, you can have some potatoes and some tomatoes yeah, and some greens. Exactly. He had no real cost in it. Free land. And, that, and the reason he's not here tonight, he's out closing on 50 acres. Where do you think he got that from? Like yep. the money to buy that. He didn't get that from like sitting around whining about social justice. He got it from going out and hustling and growing food and selling it to his neighbors and restaurants and things like that. Yeah, so we're talking about, yeah, just basic preparedness and self-reliance, or you can take it and make a living, support a family, and have the lifestyle of your dreams if you really fucking love agriculture, you know? There's real- Horticulture. Horticulture, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my goals in life, to get all of the small-scale people to stop using the word agriculture. Yeah, and yeah. I do it all the time myself. I, I still struggle with it, but like Toby really got on me with that. He's like, do you culture fields or do you culture plants? And I'm like- I culture plants. He's like, what else do you do? And I'm like, I take care of animals. He goes, that's husbandry. So you do animal husbandry and you do horticulture. You don't do any agriculture. And I was like, you know what, man, you're, you're actually right. I don't really do anything approaching that you would look at and see as modern agriculture. So Xavier kind of answered this when we were back like a, a section ago. 
I want everybody to go through and you can add to your statement uh, X when we get back to you. I'm gonna start with Sal. What is your like favorite way to grow food and maybe one or two things you grow? Um, and, and maybe like, where do you think people should start as like a technique? Cause we're getting a lot of technique questions I think are coming in from YouTube and we can't drill too deep in a technique, but like if you had to start somewhere, Sal, where would you, and what do you like, what's, what's your easy button and what do you like to grow? So this is great because we're really, we're all in different parts of the country really. So this is, sure. we're going a good different like array here. I'm in a pretty urban environment. So it's difficult for me. I don't have a lot of space. So uh, what I tried doing, uh, relatively unsuccessfully was I tried my hand at aquaponics and what I did was I set up a NFT rack a nutrient film technique where I just took a bunch of PVC pipes uh, took a hole saw drilled some holes in them I kind of let gravity do the rest I had a pump with a fish tank on the bottom that raised the water up and down through the NFT pipes and then that would filter into an ebb and flow container that I had which I just put a little bell siphon and some uh, hydrotin in and uh, I did a bunch of different plants. I tried a whole, whole bunch of shit like that. It does grow weed successfully, surprisingly. But that was about <laughs> the only thing that I was able to successfully grow. So what I found, though, is that you really you needed too much light to do this indoors. It really wasn't feasible. My cousin's an electrician, and he saw the problem I was having. He goes, I got I, I thought I'll fix this. And he comes back the next day with a fucking street lamp. I'm like, man, I'm going to go blind. I can't, I can't have this thing in here. I'm gonna, I have a cat in the house. I'm, really, I'm not going to be able to see anything. Yeah. So I scrapped that idea. Then what I did was right outside my steps on my stoop, I have um, one side, I have a nice strawberry patch that's very productive in June. And on the other side, I have a nice blackberry bush that's very productive right now in July. And every June I get breakfast from the strawberry patch and every July I get it from the blackberry bush. I take the leftovers, I make uh, pies. I'm not very good in the kitchen, but I, I made a successful strawberry pie this year, which for the first time it was successful. Right. There you go, Nicole. And uh, with the rest of it, I take it. Um, I take chia seeds, ground it up into a meal. and I just make jam. So that's basically what I grow. The other thing that I like is because, um, you know, by the way, grow what you like. Don't it doesn't make sense. And I've heard Nicole say this on her show. It doesn't make sense to have things sitting in your pantry, taking up space for no reason. So I, I drink a lot of tea. So I grow a lot of chamomile. I grow lavender. Um, I grow I have an oregano bush that I, I'm in love with. And uh you know, I grow, I grow all sorts of stuff, but what I'll do is I'll take the lavender and the chamomile I'll mix it up into a jar. That'll last me a while. The neighbors have mint. I bring them a jar of my lavender chamomile tea. They give me a jar of mint and that's it. And you know, it doesn't, it doesn't last me, you know, I'm not, you know, surviving hundred percent, but at least it's, it's a start, you know? And I, like I said, I'm in, I'm in an urban environment. Nicole. It's favorite is very hard for me to choose Jack. Cause it depends on what I'm growing. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of large volume garlic in the aquaponics system. <laughs> and if you would have asked me this a year ago, I would have said aquaponics and I like my aquaponics system and I use it for what it's best at. Um, you said a word though, late last year, and I'm, apparently I heard it while I was roasting coffee, crack key. Uh. Set me off on this whole journey of, well, could I grow lettuce in mason jars? Because I have mason jars. It doesn't cost me any money to try because I have seeds. And what I learned is, yes, you can. But if you invest a little money, you can start growing hydroponically. And I got to thinking about how a lot of people try aquaponics first because it's more organic. And mm -hmm what I've learned from growing hydroponically has made my aquaponics better. And so the skill comes from hydroponics. And what I love about it is lower weeds. And, and um, Sal, I got you on that whole growing weeds and the aquaponics things. If you have dirt, you grow weeds. And if you're in- I think he meant weed. Oh, weed? Okay, never mind, <laughs> never mind. We're not growing weed here at Holler Homestead. <clears throat> I'm not either, I promise, I'm not. <laughs> so- not even a little bit. But when I think about people who want to get started, the wicking bucket or wicking um, method where you can just manually fill the water and there's a layer, of, you know, you've got a plastic vessel, a layer of rock, weed cloth and dirt, and you have a way to get the water down to the bottom. So it fills up with water and the water wicks up into the soil for container gardening. 
is a really great way to just learn how to take care of the plants. And once you get that, you can decide is, do I want to do this one aquaponics, hydroponics, raised bed in the dirt, like all of these different methods. I think starting with the plants is where you start. And yeah, Sal, absolutely right. Grow the things you want to eat. Don't grow a bunch of broccoli. If you hate broccoli, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of broccoli that year. And then what? Yeah. Right. Unless Karen, Karen likes broccoli. Right. Yeah. Solitary, yeah. Then, I then did that. Can... I did that wrong once. The first thing I ever grew <laughs> successfully was something I didn't even like eating. And I was like, why did I do this? Yeah. So, Lock? yeah, we, um, I, like I said, the chicken and the nettles, those were easy, right? That was the, the starting point. And then we wanted lots of uh, trees. You know, we wanted a lot of peaches and, and pears and things like that. Um, then we looked at, at actual like herb gardens and, and my wife's an herbalist. So she makes a lot of medicine. I like making teas like Sal. Um, so we just threw everything in and saw what worked. I mean, we tried cilantro, we tried parsley, we tried things that shouldn't be in the area that we were in, in the mountains, um, just to see what would happen, you know, lentils, that kind of thing. Um, but I think my favorites were, you know, jalapenos. I like jalapenos a lot. And, um, I also liked pickles. And so we made a lot of cucumbers and okra, things that I ate as a kid that I was like out of, out of jars that were pickled. And now I made them myself, you know, root yeah. beer. You know, we made our own root beer and all of this wonderful stuff. So, um, and, and we did it, we built an earth ship, like a mini root cellar earth ship uh, into the side of the hill. And our most productive garden was actually on the roof of that earth ship. We did like keyhole walkways around it and everything. And like that, that like I don't like tomatoes, you know, but I like the little cherry ones. So we, we ended up growing everything we wanted to try and ended up, you know, making all kinds of really wonderful recipes and a lot of weeds, you know, people, what people call weeds like dandelion and things like that, that we would make a tremendous salads from. So like, oh yeah, all of it, you know, I just don't like grown tomatoes because they, they get blight and I don't like that. See, I got the blight too. Like Nicole posted something about like your, your power is in your tomatoes or something. I don't remember what it was, <laughs> but, but it was like, okay, so all my power dies in July. <laughs> because my tomatoes grow like crazy and in july they're like you know what screw this i'm gonna die now right. and they yeah, all mine die too. And, and so that kind of gives me like my philosophy is i i've done everything and everything's worked mostly right and some things haven't worked at all and even some things that didn't work at all they work for some people like i had a dude on my my podcast and he was like yeah straw bell gardens he's a straw bell garden guy so i'm like oh, i'll try it so when i got nine bales loaded them up bought his shit, put it in there, planted stuff, everything freaking died. And I'm like, this sucks. But I was also like, okay, he's got a quarter million people in his group on Facebook posting pictures of all their shit doing really well. So maybe I did it wrong or maybe just it's not right for my property and my lifestyle. And that's kind of my philosophy with everything. So I do hydroponics and we did a bunch with hydroponics this year. I got lots of people into it. And then we figured out like for our property, what makes the best thing for hydroponics is three things, spinach, arugula, and lettuce. That's mm. what we can grow the shit out of. And it's what we have a window that's like, for people that aren't on the feed, like a foot long for the whole year that's like 20 feet long to grow. Like we can grow it in a little tiny window in the spring and a little tiny window in the fall. And the rest of the year, it's either way too cold for a couple of weeks or way too hot. You plant lettuce in our, on our ground and it immediately sends up a big stalk and it goes. So like, okay, that's what we're going to do hydroponically indoors. We're not going to do anything else. Everything else grows outdoors. So hydroponics indoors. So now we're retooling our vertical farm. Little, It's made off of a stainless steel rack that's four foot by two foot that we keep in the garage. And okay, that's going to grow nothing but arugula, lettuce, and um, spinach. That's and the cracky-ish one, right? That, it's that's cracky-ish. It's not really yeah. cracky. It's got a pump, but yeah, it kind of sort of is. Can't so I, I trained my grandkids and my wife to run that. Okay, salad's done. Like, that's the thing. Tomatoes. So we put in four huge garden beds, just standard raised bed gardens this year. Planted the shit out of them with tomatoes. Turns out they grow really good. Get them in as early as possible. Pick them till now. Then they die. Okay, fine. We grow tomatoes for that period. And I've done a lot with like Nicole talked about with wicking beds. Even though they're the same system, they're in different spots, different solar exposure. Like all of a sudden, like you plant everything in it and this one grows chives really good. Okay, fuck it. This is the chive bed. I don't care that I wanted to grow eggplant in it. I don't give a sh Like it said, I want to grow chives. Let it grow chives. And what we've tried to do here 
in the beds, in the aquaponics, in the hydroponics, in the aquatic systems, and everything we've done is throw everything at it and whatever grows, grows. And then that's the thing that grows there. We have like wild garlic. We have like, um, I have tons of locust trees on the property. For two weeks a year, I have these beautiful white blossoms that are amazing in salads. Uh, I've got the, the, the garlic blossoms. I've got calendula. I've got all these things that are edible. And they all have windows of what time they grow and areas they grow in. And what we've tried to do is get into this hunter-gatherer mindset so that I can walk through my property and pick up something and eat it 300 days a year, three, exactly. 300 to 360 days a year, I can eat something somewhere off my property. And I don't try to be 100%, and this is where I want to go next, I don't try to be 100% self-sufficient with my food. I don't even want to be, like, I don't want to work that hard. I have other things to be doing. And if you think about it, even if you watch, like, I had people kind of do, and I, I want to go there next, but I had people do some homework for this episode and watch an episode of uh, More Time Farm where they had pig clubs. And we'll get to that next. So let's not go there yet. Um, but that same group did a thing called Tales from the Green Valley from the 1600s, where they went and they lived for like eight weeks the way people lived in the 1600s in the countryside of England. In the 1600s, people with farms in the 1600s. Guess what? They didn't grow all their own food. No, they had exchange with other people. So let's, let's go around with that. Like, what are your thoughts on like this concept of like, I'm going to produce all my own food versus I'm going to produce something and then I'm going to tie into other people. Sal? Well, that's, that, that's just it. You hit the nail on the head. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, we got that question off YouTube about uh, how to form a network, right? It's all about the economy. It's just voluntary exchange on the open market. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to. You're not going to be, at least if you're, if you have a limited amount of space, if you don't have a full on farm, it's going to be very difficult to be completely self-sufficient. So you're going to have to trade with people. The one thing though, that I will add is that um, let's not forget foraging, right? If you, to make up the difference. Uh, my, I have a couple of lavender bushes down the street. When, for that tea I was telling you about, I don't produce enough lavender to make all those jars of tea. But if I include all the, all the bushes down the streets I can find in the woods, then yeah, I can. So uh, it's all about exchange and, uh, you know, filling in the gaps where you can. Yep. We have a friend up in North Carolina who's all about goats. They got tons of goats. And then, so they produce goat milk, goat cheese, and some of the most amazing goat cheese. And like, I don't want to be messing with goats. You know what I mean? Like, they're silly. And <laughs> they, we, I well, hate goats. Well, I'll tell you a story, right? We used to have this, we used to have like four goats, right? And the one billy goat, his balls were gone, but he still was just a pain in the ass. He would jump fences that I built to be 10 foot tall, <laughs> jump over the damn fence, go to my neighbor's house who kept ornamentals and all these, and like American oh, flags, no. son of a senator. And like it, every day, every day he would go over there and start eating his Eat beautiful flag. animals yeah yeah and so, eating a flag and one day my kids were crying there was a ton of shit going on he calls i'm answering the phone and i'm like shoot the damn goat then he calls the police right because he won't shoot the goat i would have yeah. loved it if he just shot the damn goat. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't so um so we ended up trading that goat that night for like real good moonshine right so Back to this good friend of mine. She has goats and does like a phenomenal job selling goat cheese and goat milk. And she produces vegetables and stuff herself. But then this is something that she produces good, well, she enjoys it and God bless her. And so like, you know, find that, that cool cash crop. And Jack, you re it reminded me of a story you told about like, if you're in a strange area like North Carolina, grow some coffee, some strange strain of coffee and sell it to a, a, a small brewery. Brewery, yeah. So, yeah, in a glass house, obviously, in North Carolina, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and get like a cool little relationship built. And so you, I don't know that you want to find a national distribution, like what you talked about. It's like, I sell duck eggs. I'm not trying to sell 20,000 duck eggs. You know, it, it's your lifestyle. You have, you have, you enjoy your time. You make enough to live. You got enough to buy a cool car. You know, like what else do you really need? Yeah, I mean, like what you're saying there, like I was, I, I talked about that and I decided not to do it, but I thought about building like a really long glass house, greenhouse, and, and growing coffee. And then making a deal with Roar Brewery, which is in Fort Worth. And they do distribute outside the state, but they also do every year, like, you know, a very small run of very high end, big bottle beers. And those are all, if you're not local, you're not getting it. 
Right. And I'm talking beer that's like $22, $23 a bottle for about a wine size bottle of beer. And I was like, I could grow, I guarantee if I could go grow coffee enough to make, you know, I don't know, a hundred cases of that shit and go down to Fort Worth, knock, because they're not hard to approach, knock on the front door. Hey, here's some roasted coffee. Nicole, we're going to be getting Nicole to roast it and be like, I grew this coffee in fucking Fort Worth. And you can have Fort Worth coffee stout with Fort Worth coffee. Like who's going to compete with that? Right. Who's going to like, even a big company's like, fuck that. That's not, there's not enough money there. But I might be able to sell that coffee for eighty dollars a pound to those people because they're going to put an ounce of beans into a bottle that they're going to sell for twenty five dollars, and somebody's going to buy that bottle and be like, "Dude, this coffee stout is made in Fort Worth from fucking coffee grown in fucking Fort Worth, man!" Like, and I think that person is retarded to pay twenty five dollars a bottle for that beer, but. They will. I will totally sell him that two ounces of coffee for that that bottle of beer. And I will take that money and I will invest it in myself. And if I could do it for cryptocurrency, that would be even better. Nicole? So I came into the prepping world, Jack, not knowing I was a prepper. I just moved to the country and started growing stuff and hate going to the grocery store. So I'm listening to this podcast called The Survival Podcast, and I became aware that I was a prepper and I had already developed at that point, a community of people with whom I could trade. And we had a backup plan. If shit hits the fan, you do the meat, you grow the vegetables. And it was based on what we're good at, what we like to do. And I've never thought that growing all of your food and providing all of your food by yourself was how that's going to go. If I have to do it, um, well, A, it's going to be boring what I eat a little bit, you know, it's, because if I can't trade my goat cheese for my friend's pecans, I don't have pecan trees. And unless I go find pecan trees, right? So it's never made sense to me that you should 100% from your property. I actually have a friend named Kelly Mayer who's going to kill me because I can't remember her website who has started a 12 month challenge on her homestead. She's only allowed to eat what's produced there but she can trade so right now she's jonesing because she can't get coffee we're looking for a coffee producer who will trade for something so that i can roast her some coffee but check out that challenge acknowledges you're not going to grow everything on your property Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so absolutely yeah i just i think it's it it behooves you to develop those relationships and find things to trade for (laughs) because Otherwise, your life is boring. If, if he can't go down the road and get the rest of his lavender, you know, then you got to buy it at the store. That's worse. Yeah, right? I mean, I remember uh, Rob Greenfield. Um, I don't know if you guys know who he is. He did this project this year, uh, last year, actually. He was in Florida, and he built this little tiny house, which was more like a shed in somebody's backyard. It was more like a tent shed because it was like soft walls. And he said he had to either grow or gather a hundred percent of his own food for a year. And when he said a hundred percent, he was not fucking around like salt. He went to the beach and evaporated fucking water wow. to make salt. That's how hardcore this dude was. was. Gandhi. Wow. So like I get on the internet, I'm like, well, what's your address. He tells me. And in like five minutes, I'm like, here's five locations with ponds. Cause he had talked about going fishing at the ocean. He had to get a ride basically bum one or hitchhike or whatever because he had a bicycle and like he was in orlando so the beach is like two hours away and i'm like all of these ponds have bluegills and, and bullhead catfish it's like how'd you find it i'm like google maps it's like how long did it take i'm like two minutes and he was a little worried about overspray and shit like that because he's very eco and all but like like i know places around me that i can go to that are five minutes away and fish and yeah, the state says I have to have a license. And guess how many game wardens I've seen at places like this in 50 years of living? Zero. Game wardens don't go to city parks. I maybe in your state, not in mine. Like they're just not there. But some of these places, like in Texas, we can throw a cast net to catch non-game fish and bluegills, sunfish, all that shit is considered non-game fish. So I can go down there with like two handfuls of fish pellets and throw the, the net like three times. And with a cooler and a 
air pump, I can bring home like 200 fish that are itty bitty, like three inches long. I can throw them one of my backyard ponds and I can feed them mostly from stuff from my backyard for a year. And I've got like half pound panfish. And I, the, 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 the people are like, well, I know places I can go catch those fish that big already. Go do that. I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. What I'm saying is, okay, now you have to either smoke that, salt that, can it, like all those ways of preserving fish suck. Like, you know, like salting fish in a barrel or whatever. It's nasty. Like my fish are alive. If I need two fish tonight, I go out there with a hand line. And in five seconds, I've got two fish and I'm making fish tacos. And like people are like, well, you know, I can't build one of these. Like if you guys look at my YouTube channel, I have these beautiful ponds. We call them Miyagi ponds, like Mr. Miyagi from uh, Karate Kid. And they're built out of four by fours and pond liners and all that. And they're, they're, you know, like my 12 by 12 cost me like three grand to build. Well, I understand you can't do that. Go on Craigslist. Go on Craigslist and look for above ground pools. You'll find people on Craigslist like, I can't fucking get rid of this thing and I need to. And they'll give you an above ground pool for free if you go take it apart, put it back together. You have a 24,000 gallon fucking pond. Set that up in your backyard. Take that filter, take all the sand and shit out of it. Fill it up with pieces of PVC pipe, make it a biofilter. Turn it on. You've got a pond in your backyard. Start growing fish in it. Take a 100-gallon stock tank. Sink it in there so the top's above it. Drill some holes in it. Fill it with minnows. Whenever your fish are hungry, dip some minnows out. Throw them in your pond. Like, now you're producing protein for nothing. You're feeding the minnows plankton that grows in your pond. This will take like a year or two to get going. But what do you have at that point? And like a $800 at the top end investment in solar, We'll run, if, if you want to be off grid, we'll run that shit forever. And, and like, these are the things that you can just do. And people say, well, I can't do it. I don't know any place where you can't have a pool. Like even with HO, you have a pool. Yeah. If your pool's a pond, it's not a pond, it's a pool. Dude, so that's like, you can teach a yeah. man to fish or give him a fish, or you can teach him how to fish. You just went, took it to a whole nother level. It's like, you can either grow a fish. Man how to fish, grow fish or grow a fucking pond ecosystem. Yeah. And it's not but like- I Go think ahead, you need Nicole. to acknowledge what your superpower is, right? Yeah. That's your superpower. Doing that's shit your... like that. So like, and if that's not yours and you don't want to do right. that, My superpower that. is getting to know people and processing stuff. So I yeah. have people who hunt and kill deer and put them in my outside fridge and they understand I'll process it. Give them some of the, you know, I take some of the meat, I give them the rest. I think this is such an individualized thing when you start growing your own food. And also that's know great. what your superpower is because right? it's not... don't try to be me don't try to be nicole don't try right. to be xavier don't try to be sal be yourself and figure out what what part you play in this and then hook into other people that do it like you mentioned deer so what i i've always been afraid to pick deer up off the road in texas because it's, it's illegal so you can do it here right we're not supposed to do it in pennsylvania you call the game warden he gives you a number over the phone you pick the deer up well, I did that once. I put out a video and I explained like, this is what to look for. I, I did this dissection. I had like 20 videos. It was like the best content I ever did on YouTube. And so he's like, the game war is going to come get you. <laughs> Fuck, and I had to take it all down. I'm like, shit, because this is like proof that I did this whole thing. It's illegal in Texas. So I start talking to my brother-in-law, who's a cop. And he's like, dude, no one gives a flying fuck about that. <laughs> like, yeah, like if somebody calls or whatever, but yeah, like no one cares. So then like a couple of days after that, I'm driving back to the house and it's cold out. So whenever this deer got hit, it's still fresh. And there's this deer laying on the side of the road and I pass it. And I have to go like a mile and a half around to get back to it. And as I get back to it, there's a cop standing there with his hands on his hips looking at it like, well, what the fuck do I do? Because it's like blocking this on-ramp or off-ramp from the, the, the little mini highway. And I'm like, well, shit. Mark said, no one cares. So I pull over and I'm like, dead deer. He goes, yeah. I'm like, well, I was going to pick it up. He goes, for what? I'm like, I was going to fucking eat it. He's like, grab an end. <laughs> so this is totally illegal. And the cop helps me put it in the truck. I just drove away. Yeah. And as like as you get. Half, the, half the half, half the ass end of this deer was like hammered. But I ended up with like 40 pounds of meat for free 
by picking it up and processing it. So Nicole gets people that are like, I'll bring you my deer because I'm a pussy and I don't know how to process my own deer. Keep bringing her deer. Don't believe that. Anyway, so she gets half the deer for doing the work. I'll pick one off the road and I'll do that work. And I started realizing like just by getting up at like, you know, you get up at like four in the morning, go hunting. And I like to do it if I have a place to go. But where I live, I have to travel to do it. I can get up at like 630 and drive like this two mile ring around my house. <laughs> right. And, and if I do that at the right time of year, I can pick up enough meat to fill two deep freezers a year with deer meat. Even if I have to throw half of it to the dogs, throw half of it away because it's blood damaged or whatever. I have free meat by driving in a circle. And that's the mindset you have to start coming out with food is like, you may not be able to do that, but I guarantee you can do something. Where there's a will, there's a way. If you, if you, if you want to make it happen, you can and you will make it happen. And you might not be able, like I said before, you might not be able to get 100% of your food supply independent, but you know, every little bit helps. Even if it's just a small amount. Go ahead. I have a question for all of you, actually. It just occurred to me that let's say we get into uh, a excessive rule of law or the opposite in the next okay. five to 10 years, right? Right now we have game wardens who generally pass out tickets and because most people are lawful, they actually stick to the amount of tickets that they buy and all of that. If it was a grid down sort of the chain, food chain supply is, is you know down and people needed to get food, there are a lot of people throughout the country who will go hunting deer, squirrel, rabbit, bear, whatever, right? Do you think that they will pick everything clean or do you think they have enough brains in their head to make sure that the, the animals stay, uh, have, have, have livelihoods and, and the ability to, to last without, throughout the year. Go ahead. What I think is interesting about that is um, in, in a lot of these communist countries and socialist countries that have experienced these sorts of collapses, the first thing to go are the cats and the dogs. The second thing to go are the cows and the chickens and then the horses go and pretty soon there's no animals in sight left. So I think, I think they're going to pick, the entire environment clean. There's a great documentary on Netflix called Cuba and the Cameraman. This dude goes back every 10 years, starting in like 1970, and he interviews the same people. And one of these dudes that he interviews is like a farmer. And the first time he goes, he has five cows. 10 years later, he's got three cows. And by the last time he goes, it's just this guy sitting in an empty field, because that's what happens when the government collapses. People will do anything to make sure that they and their, their kids can eat. And you really, it's hard to blame them in a situation like that. Yeah, if you look at the Civil War, um, part of why the turkey almost went extinct was that during the Civil War, people overhunted it. And when, as they started reintroducing it, there was a lot of regulation, and there still is a lot of regulation around that, but it's because people who are hungry will get food. We see this now with minor shortages in the grocery stores, right? Yeah. And not just the toilet paper frenzy, but in, when when the meat aisle is empty, then for the next three weeks, people are like, oh, I got to go. I got to get that. Right. And people who are now probably I don't know for sure, but starting to experience some financial insecurity and food insecurity and didn't have stuff stored up once they're hungry. All bets are off. All bets yeah. are off. And and that's, you know, you like it's hard to be disciplined about only killing the male deer, for example, which is sort of our culture in, in my holler. Um, when you got a family to feed and you see a big, beautiful doe walk, walk by. Can't and, eat horns. Yeah. Can't eat horns. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I have a neighbor who just wants the horns. like the rest of the animal. I mean, that, that neighbor is awesome. He just oh, comes yeah, out yeah. and he's like, you can have the whole thing. And I'm like, yes. I need three of those. Like, yeah. like in Texas, we have a deal. Like a lot of our counties, uh, your license will let you take four does and one buck. Yeah. Because there's such a desire for antlers that we actually have an overpopulation of female. Yeah. And yeah. so they, and like we even have like Hunters for the Hungry is huge here. Where they actually, insist, like, okay, look, you're coming here to this ranch and you're paying a bunch of money to shoot a big rack you're going to put on your wall we need you to shoot three does while you're here and you don't have to do anything. We'll give them to hungry people. And that's, that's the surplus we're dealing with now on the, what will happen. I think it's a, you, you know, my favorite answer, most of y'all, it depends, right? Like it depends. And 
it depends on where you are and what your mindset is. So what it makes me think of is my grandfather. One time I was out because I was, when I was a kid, I used to love to play in his tool shed and everything and find all kinds of old shit. And I find these rat traps and they're like made with like oak planks. Like we would never make a rat trap this way today. And like this thing would like, if it would have snapped down on like a coyote's leg, it would have like held a coyote, but it was clearly a rat trap. But they had these big ass like inch and a, or one half inch holes drilled in the wood of the rat trap. And I was like, I don't know how the hell this is. I took it to grandpa. I'm like, grandpa, what is this? He goes, well, dams are squirrel traps. What? What do you mean? He goes, what we would do, we'd take a screw, we'd screw it through the hole into the tree, set the trap and bait it with peanut butter. And when the squirrel came, he'd get killed by the rat trap on the side of the tree. And this was from the Great Depression. And I said, well, how'd it work? He said, great for about three years. Yeah. And they were gone. Right. And after about three years, there weren't a lot of squirrels left. I'm like, well, what'd you do then? He said, we ate other things. And, and that's kind of where my mind is in this about people wiping it out. People will always go to the easiest place first. And there's a learning curve to the next tier. Mm -hmm. So when all this shortage shit started, the first people that re reacted overboard were all preppers. And the first things that disappeared other than toilet paper and water were things like wheat berries I'm like y'all are preppers y'all been buying wheat berries for 30 fucking years right what are you doing cleaning out honeyville of all their wheat you know 50 pound bags of wheat berries or whatever and people are like man i'm trying i'm trying to get some wheat berries i'm like do you eat wheat berries like no but i might have to i'm like all right hold on right let me see if i can find you some wheat berries so i'm like call a fucking feed store hey man I need uh, some sacks of grain. Like what? Wheat, rye, barley. Hey, we got everything. The feed store is fucking full up. Same fucking wheat, but it's for chickens. No problem. All right. So I'm like, go to the feed store. About three weeks later, fucking feed store is out of wheat. All right. Let me think about this. Homebrew stores. So I start checking homebrew stores. Raw grain. They got all you want. No problem. And next thing I know, hey, the homebrew stores, they're like, I ain't helping y'all no more. Y'all fuck everything up, right? Like, you got to stop this shit buying everything out. But my point is, like, there was this progression of where you could get things. So will everybody go kill all the deer if we have a food shortage? Most people in America today, unlike during my grandfather's era, couldn't get a deer if you gave them a spotlight and a 22 with a silencer and told them to go out at night and get one, which by the way, I'm not saying we did it, but maybe, you know, maybe we occasionally did that one. Wait, I, I thought guns were bad, Jack. Oh, guns are good. Guns are good. <laughs> but like, good, like man. they couldn't do it with that, let alone just going out in the woods and getting one with a game warden looking for you. So I think before you see enough pressure on the big game, to take the level down to where you actually have to worry about it. If you could, if you could do it tomorrow, I think you'll be able to do it next year. Even if the worst happens, because most of the people that say they're going to do it, they're not capable. So the question, the question I have for you is, well, if you, if you could go do that tomorrow, could you, would you know how, you know, because I look at things like, well, you know, People say, well, the suppressor and the government stamp and all, like, I'm big on getting around shit. So, like, I have this load for the 44 Magnum that you can hand load that's so quiet, it's quieter than a suppressor load, but it will totally go through the head of a deer at 35 yards, right? And it's quiet as shit. You can hear the hammer fall of the gun over the, the report. So, like, I could go out and I could use that for a while. So, let's say eventually everybody starts taking out the deer. Okay, there's no deer left. Fine. I'll go out with a cast net, like I was talking about earlier. And with a cast net, I can catch a couple hundred of these little tiny fish no one else knows what to do with. I'll make fish stew. I'll cook all that fish and I'll, I'll you know, you've got nothing else to do if we're in this situation. I'll sit my grandkids down, they can pick meat off and we'll make something to eat out of that with stuff we grow in the backyard. So I think like this idea that they'll pick the, the, the earth clean like the learning curve necessary to get to where you can get to where I'm at, you'll die first. Before you get to what I already know, and I'm not that smart, you'll starve to death before you get there. So I think that the focus then needs to be on the skill set and the mindset, not the thing, if that makes sense. 
There's a, <clears throat> there's a great book called River in Darkness by Masaji Ishikawa, who lived in North Korea. And a lot of the book is about, well, how, how they all starve to death, basically. And one of the things he says, I mean, it's, it's pretty gross, but they would actually eat the bark off of the pine tree when it got to be that bad. And I guess what it does is that actually will clog up your own asshole. And these people would have to like dig the pine bark out of their asses just to go to the bathroom. That's how desperate people will get. So you want to talk about picking the earth clean. I mean, that just goes to show you. I only bring up such a... See, my thing with that, Hesal, though, is I bet you there was something to eat in that person's, like, right. two over... And they didn't know what it was. I would agree uh, with you, yeah. During the Confederacy um, decline, if you read the book, Ersatz and the Co Confederacy, you find that, like, when the Union troops came in and they were burning everything, like, one of the things people lived on were, like, they call them cow peas, black-eyed peas, you know, red peas, whatever. Well, the reason they were still able to live on them is when the Yankee soldiers came through, they didn't burn those fields because they didn't recognize it as food. They didn't know it was like, they didn't ever grow that. They had never seen that. They didn't know it was food. They thought it was a field of weed. So why would I waste my, you know, my, my oil or whatever on like burning this field? There was no food there. So after the, the union march went through, they would then go glean that field. And, and that's what I'm saying. There's so much edible out there. That if, even if this happens, you need to learn now what those things are you can rely on. I guarantee you, I don't care where you live, Alaska to Florida to California to Maine, I can come to your house and probably within three yards of where you live, if you live in Karenville, I can find something edible. And you'll sit there and starve and not know you could have ate, ate, ate that thing. And that's something that like, people need to start working on now. Oh, God. It's like something they needed to start working on three years ago. I mean, it, we're behind the eight ball in a big way. But so you can learn one new thing every month. Yeah, or every day. Just, just right? start. Start on that. On that, every person here has things we teach. And what I want to end with this time around is let's make sure that people that are tuning in tonight know how they can learn more about all of our hosts and the things that they do. Let's start with Sal on that. Because people can learn more about counter economics from you. How can they do that, dude? Well, you mean where they can find me? Yeah. SalDiagoras.com. I make it nice and easy. I got everything in one place. Um, I got a podcast, The Agora. I publish a blog, newlibertarian.io. Um, I've got a couple of meme pages, Sal the Agorist on Twitter. I have another one on Facebook, Abolish Gun Free Zones. Follow all that stuff. And really all of it's on my website. So and Before we go away from you. Yeah. Say very slowly your site to get 3D printers because it took me a week to find it and I know you. Spell it. Spell and I'm it. about and I'm about to buy a fucking printer from you. So tell people how to get a 3D printer from you. It's called 3D printer go bird.com. B R R R three R's. <laughs> and we came up with it. It's based on the meme because when they started printing money, we came out with the meme where they were like, haha, money printer go burr. And we were like, all right, well. <laughs> Haha, <laughs> gun printer go burr. So <laughs> that's where the name came from. Um, I'm happy. We almost two thirds of our sales so far have been in cryptocurrency. So it just goes to show you that if you, you know, if, if where there's a will, there's a way. If you provide a solution for people, hopefully there's going to be some agris or some counter economists out there to take advantage of it. I'll tell you a place I could have used a 3D printer this weekend. So um, I built this vertical hydroponics farm. And I took my, these two big giant trays out of it and I set them out in the sun to bake the uh, algae out of them. And in our Texas sun, my fucking bulkheads, which are the penetrators that let the water flow through, melted. Review. Yeah, they melted and like, it's like shit. Like I can't, <laughs> I got to order new ones. And I was like, if I had a 3D printer, I don't care if it took eight hours a piece to print them. I would have got that project done last weekend. And I don't care if I can buy them for $4 and if it costs me $8 in media, like, the time is what I lost. Like now I'm doing a project next weekend that I wanted to do this weekend. So I think 3D printers, I think we're only starting to scratch the surface on what they can do. And one of the things too, by the way, when I had the, we were talking about the NFT system earlier, nutrient film technique with aquaponics with the PVC pipes. Well, you need these net cups. I'm sure you know these in the pipe. I 3D printed half of them. Um, half of them were 3D printed. So, That's I mean, cool. yeah, I mean, you just have to be versatile. That's all. That's a great idea yeah. because most of them, I'm not happy with three, uh, the, um, the net cups, 
I think they're all like what I do. I buy net cups and I end up pruning out like half yeah. of yeah, the right. things. Everybody that like gets into this does that. So it'd be great if they were just already the way that I like them. Or you could I'll, design I'll, them. You could design them specifically how you wanted to. You know, that's even better. I'll pay somebody like you to do it. It's too much work. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know how to program shit. Um, Hawk, tell people yeah. how they can find you. So on all social media at Xavier Hawk, X A V as in Victor, I E R H A W K. And then I build blockchain currency and community management systems at Fireon Global Partners. And that's spelled P H I R E O N globalpartners.com or just fireon.com. And that's Phi as in like the Phi golden ratio, like fire on P H I R E O N.com. Yeah, I feel I like there's something with our club idea that we were tossing around that you could help with. Yeah, I don't know what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do that maybe next week. Yeah, we'll make that happen for sure. Nicole. Okay, so I have a podcast where I talk about building independence in your life and building the life you want to live, as well as homesteading things. That's livingfreeintennessee.com. You don't have to be from Tennessee to like it. You have to like me to like it, probably. That's about the only thing. And then I also am a coffee roaster, hollerroast.com, H-O-L-L-E-R, roast, R-O-A-S-T.com. And I'm looking, I'm going to say this now, I'm looking for somebody who produces coffee, green coffee beans that I can buy, because the minute I get that, I can have a 100% crypto coffee solution. Right now, you can buy my coffee for crypto, but I'm paying us dollars for the green beans i've figured out pretty much everything else that i can do with crypto so people from really... like rwanda right so there's a currency exchange and right it's a mess governments and import taxes and yeah yeah so if you can sell your coffee for crypto i will have at least one line that's 100 percent crypto and i'd love to do that so the crypto I... grind yeah that that's the name already the crypto i see jack just names all my stuff that's what he does he tells my story really well too i learned from him i try to you know and i think that's like i'll tell you another thing guys like in addition to everything we said today if you want to actually sell whatever you had learn to learn to tell your story in an exciting way learn to be passionate about what you love if you can do that you can sell an idea uh, as far as getting in touch with me, uh, I'm Jack Spirko. My show is called The Survival Podcast. It's running for 12 years. Uh, we have about a quarter million downloads per episode over a day or two after we put them out. Um, you can check us out there. If you don't want to type all those in, you can go tspc.co. And uh, it's a short URL that will get there. And I'm on Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. And you can just throw my name in. Jack Spirko, and it's S-P-I-R-K-O, which makes no sense unless you're Ukrainian. And uh, you'll find me if you look that up online. I just want to make sure you guys knew how to find all of our all of our folks in the gaggle today. And we're going to be working really heavily, uh, Nicole and I are especially, on the, uh, the Unloose the Goose website. We had, uh, you guys just like kick ass and like you broke our website. Our website's only like a month old and you destroyed Nicole. Nicole's like, I'll just host it. Because my admin guys are like, we don't have time to do this shit right now. And Nicole's like, I'll host it in like three weeks in. Like, oh. I'll get that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It crashed. So we had to move it. And Nicole had to do everything manually. And so we have to kind of retool the website a little bit. All we got are three big geese looking at you right now uh, in the episodes. And we can stream it out on all the podcast networks. But we'll square that away. We'll make sure you can get like subscribe to our email list and stuff like that again. And, subscribe and, is up and contact form is up today okay great so that's you can back. subscribe i'm gonna actually redesign the home page again so it looks pretty but yeah the, the function is there and, and i think we uh, like we are getting questions from youtube and and we're like we've set an agenda and then like a question comes in and it doesn't really fit maybe what we could do for our next episode and then the, the one after that we'll do kind of maybe dig into what hawk does with Firon. Uh, but maybe the next one we could just do like a straight up we'll bullshit for like 10 minutes and then take nothing but questions from the audience because we haven't really done that yet and the reason we haven't is like generally when you have like five fucking episodes of a podcast you don't have a fucking audience yet but because of this group uh i'll just announce this tonight to everybody out there publicly we're in a top 30 podcasts on itunes and we've been around a month 
and, and I think everybody here would probably extend like a big fucking thank you. Yes, thank to you. To everybody that's tuned in and, and done that. Like that's insane. Like that took me a while when I started out in podcasting. I'm 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 actually worried that this podcast is gonna overtake my podcast in that category. Like I'm not worried. I think like that would be a good thing, but like that's crazy that we're at top 30 on iTunes in four episodes. So I think we owe something to the audience. So maybe that's, what do you guys think? What do you think for next week? We just come in, bullshit, talk about what we're drinking for 10 minutes to give people time to get in. And what, free for all, whatever people ask, we just answer the best we can. I like that. Sounds good to yeah, me. Definitely. Yeah. We can take it from the Unloose the Goose telegram. So if you don't know, we have a telegram for Unloose the Goose. Um, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes that people can join up and chat in the telegram we've had a lot of fun conversations in there so far. <laughs> yeah that's going crazy man I, I i love telegram guys you guys want to start using that like i've tried to get all my family on it like going hey you can either continue to um let you know apple or android and google know every word you say or you can go full encrypted and my theory on encryption is if you send your aunt a picture of a little kitty hanging on like you know hang on annie whatever that should be encrypted just so that they have to like put all the effort of their machine into decrypting that for six months like everything we do should be encrypted so telegram's the way to go there um my my, my just a little bit on that my my thought on the weakness of telegram is it's like this one giant stream of thought so two things on that one i think we need a place that we can get activity going and I don't want to build anything else on Facebook ever. I hate Facebook. I despise them. We have a very, we have some very successful groups. We're getting threatened by Facebook in all of our groups. Uh, like you posted this fake news thing and it's like, well, no, it's actually true. And if you keep doing this, we're going to like not tell people in your group that you have new content. We have a MeWe group for Unloose the Goose, but there's like nobody doing anything there. I would love to give all my effort to MeWe. And if people will do it, I'll come back. I'll show up. Um, I'm doing a lot on Parlor or Parlay right now. But if you're not, that's more like a Twitter thing. And I just think we need to maybe think about that too. Like, do we need to be using the system's platforms well, at all anymore? I, I say from like YouTube. We, you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, for now. For now. And like, my thing is like, I believe in using their shit against them. But like, once you get enough momentum, don't you then go, okay, we're going to go over here. Yeah, yeah. Dude, so Firon will be launched at the, the hopefully in the beginning of this fall, and it, it'll have all of that functionality. And it's going to be, I mean, it's all about uh, regenerative agriculture, living properly, you know, healthy living and all of the, the ways that we want to see the world go. So it would just make sense. Um, as long as it's easy enough that a boomer can do it, we're good. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's like the boomer test. Like, you, my grandparents, they're dead. They don't have to be able to do anything. But like, if it won't work for a boomer, it's too complicated. And the best part is everybody's part owner. So it's a, like a cooperative. Everybody owns it and owns the data. So there's no, like, you get spammed or you can say, hey, here's a way to make money on this platform and then take it away from them because you don't like what they're saying. Like, that's fucked So up. buy in or get out. Yeah. And as we go on, I'm sure we'll develop a presence on all the different social media platforms too. Yeah. yeah. Why not? So guys, hey, I appreciate you guys all taking some time to be with us tonight and hanging out. And I just want to say thank you to everybody that tuned in today uh, live and everybody that's listening to us on the podcast distribution networks. And again, thanks a lot, man, to, to bring it. We're actually number 28 in philosophy on iTunes. Yeah, that's so amazing. Do, I just want to give a shout out to Luke Stokes, Martin Snow, Foo Bear, Wylena McCulley, um, we've got Kurt Nordine, and Smaggy8, who I've seen a bunch of times, and Nicole, Nicholas Covey. There's a bunch of others, but thank you all so much for showing up and enjoying our time with us. Yeah, I feel like we, we didn't really pay enough attention to people on live feed this week. So next week, it's going to all be about you guys. We will uh, we'll just interact the entire time. Guys, thanks for being with us tonight.